when you understand the power of these brain triggers, the brain triggers are there. When you understand the power of brain triggers, then you have to, you know, you go like, oh, I got to use this. Welcome to Give a Heck. I am your host, Dwight Heck, and for much of my life, lived my life in quiet desperation, wondering how I was going to pay the bills, take vacations, save for retirement, and one day wondering if I would get off the hamster wheel of life and have purpose. A life that most of society lives, which takes us to work, then home, then repeat, and pays us hopefully enough just to survive. The harsh truth that most live with more months than money and have no idea how to live life on purpose, not by accident. This ensures the mass majority are living not just financially broke, however emotionally and mentally as well due to financial pressures. In each episode, I will introduce you to thoughts, ideas, and guests that can help you to learn how you too can live life on purpose, not by accident. Good day, and welcome to Give a Heck. On today's show, I welcome James I. Bond. James is one of America's leading behavioral management specialists and author of the award-winning and mind-bending book, Brain Glue, pardon me, How Selling Becomes Much Easier by Making Your Ideas Sticky. For 13 years, he ran one of Southern California's leading behavioral management firms, working with a who's who of American business. Early in his career, he ran an advertising agency in Montreal. He is a workshop leader and a past workshop chairman for the resource partner of the U.S. Small Business Administration and has been a featured guest speaker at three Southern California universities. I'd like to welcome you to the show, James. Thanks so much for agreeing to come on and share with us some of your life journey. Oh, thank you, Dwight, for having me. You're welcome. I look forward to this conversation. Um, the things that you've discovered and been able to learn throughout your lifetime to be able to help people really be able to attract the right sales, right? To be able to have the right person purchase their product or service, or even utilize um, your techniques to be a better mom, a better dad. Just some of the things that I was enthralled when I was reading up on you when I uh, prepped for the show yesterday. I look forward to this conversation, and I'm sure my listeners and viewers will enjoy it as well. So, James, as I mentioned before our, um, I hit record, I focus on a person's origin story from their earliest recollections to where they are today. For the people new to the show, the reason I do that is really at the end of the day, we need to acknowledge the fact that our past, our life from our earliest recollections to where we are today have taught us to learn patterns, whether good, bad, or ugly, that have led us to where we are today. And it's part of the growth process of why the people I have on my show or myself have gotten to where we're at because we've had circumstances, challenges, character building moments that we needed to overcome to be the person that we are today to serve and serve humankind to the most effective way. So James, please tell me your origin story and what key things from your childhood to adulthood that led you to where you're at currently. Can I start with my birth? <laughs> sure. Origin stories. I started as a, a sperm. We're, and it was not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were you're, you're, you're born. <laughs> I don't know right. if you're birthed. You're okay, born. So <laughs> I'm the oldest of four kids. Okay. And I had a very noisy family. In fact, it was so noisy that uh, they would cut me off whenever I would start saying something, particularly my middle brother. I have a brother, two brothers and a sister, my middle brother and my mom that I would start saying something and they would uh, cut me off. And so I learned to talk fast to try to get everything in without realizing, I mean, I kind of knew it, that that's not really an effective way to communicate. Uh, but that really affected me for a large part of my life. Um, I eventually, I'm originally from Montreal. Um, I live in Southern California now. I built one of California's leading behavioral management firms. We work with people like Warren Buffett's team, on his way to becoming the world's richest man, uh, Saul Price, who invented the Price Club and Costco and uh, just a lot of others. So that was really great. So I'm really fascinated by psychology and um, behavioral management. I'm a specialist in behavioral management and marketing and how it applies. Uh, in Montreal, 
I worked my way up and eventually won major clients like Kraft Foods, Timex Watches, Abbott Laboratories, Seagram's, their world headquarters is in Montreal. And so I had the opportunity to win. I was very visual in the ads that we did. Uh, and I was very, uh, very logical. I'm a logical person, as a lot of people out there are. And uh, I had the opportunity to win the anti-drug campaign in America. With, we came up with powerful, logical reasons why you should not do drugs. And they loved the campaign, but we lost. And who did we lose to? A guy holding an egg saying, this is your brain. And cracking the shell and dropping the egg into a sizzling frying pan. This is your brain on drugs. Any questions? When I saw the ad, two things happened. First was, I recognized that was profoundly more powerful than anything I knew how to do. It was really, it was persuasive. It was amazing. And the second thing was, it terrified me. I mean, how can I be in advertising and marketing and life and not know how to do emotional selling? This was not logical. It was emotional selling. And it freaked me out. And so I realized that they don't teach emotional selling in school. And I went to the library. There's books that superficially cover it, but nobody really covers it. That's why people are blown away by the book, The Brain Glue, because it's opening it's opening your eyes to something that we see all the time, but we don't recognize. That's why that's successful. That's why that's successful. But so I love three by five cards. So I wrote your brain on drugs on a three by five card. So I'd remember the ad. Next to my computer, I put a box and I call it the passion box. And whenever I saw an ad or heard something that was emotionally powerful, it could be a speech as somebody would say, I would put it in the box. I love Winston Churchill had great lines. Okay. He's really funny sometimes too. Uh, Britain's Winston Churchill, but um uh, and comedians, too. So I, I would put all these things in a box. My wife hated going to doctor's offices with me because I'd be going through, you know, in a doctor's office, you have magazines you don't normally look at. I'm looking at like Vogue magazine. I don't subscribe to Vogue. And I'm going through. I go, oh, wow. And she goes, do not tear it out of the magazine. I said, no, no, look at this ad. It's fantastic. I've got it. You know, this is an emotional ad, not not logical. And she would sit as far away as possible from me, pretending I do not know that guy, okay? But so after about 10 years, more than 10 years of putting things inside the box, the passion box, and we had moved to Southern California, I met John Gray. And John Gray was telling me, he's an author, and he was telling me how he wrote this incredible, one of the best relationship books ever, and he called it Men, Women, and Relationships. And he was frustrated because people would read the book and it would blow their minds. This was like profound. It's such a good book. And yet he only sold a few thousand copies. He couldn't get people to buy the book. And so he got this crazy idea. What if I change the title to men are from Mars, women are from Venus and tweak the content a little so it's consistent with the title. So it refers to it throughout the book, but it's the same basic book. What do you think happened? Almost overnight, half a million copies got sold, then a million, then two million. In my book, I say he sold 10 million copies. I was talking to Steve Harrison, who helps him with marketing, who helps uh, John Gray with marketing. And John, he says, you're wrong. I said, well, I did my research. He said, no, no, no. We're over 50 million books sold now. He went from 20,000 to 50 million books sold, all because he changed the title? Wow. And so I took... A three by five card because I love three by five cards. And I wrote your brain on drugs. I mean, sorry, <laughs> men are from Mars. I did the other one. Okay. But men are from Mars. And when I got home, I was going to put it in the box, my passion box. And I went, wait a second. He's using a metaphor. Men aren't really from a different planet. Well, I mean, some people think we're from a different planet. And I can understand that. But we're not really from a different planet. It's a metaphor. I also realized this is your brain on drugs. It's also a metaphor because that wasn't a brain. It's an egg that he was cracking, putting it into a frying pan. But I suddenly went, are metaphors the secret to emotional selling or at least one of the secrets? So when I got home, I dumped the passion box on my bed and quickly discovered 14, there are 14 brain triggers and that metaphors is just one of 14 brain triggers at the heart of emotional selling. I thought my brain was going to explode. I suddenly realized have I just uncovered something? I mean, when you include a brain trigger in what you say or what you post, 
or what you advertise or what you're trying to get your kids to go to bed, whatever it is, if you can include a brain trigger in what you say, it in most cases radically increases the persuasion power of what you're saying. Now, that's why, I mean, marketers love brain glue, okay? So we got that, and I'll give you some examples of that. But people are realizing this goes way beyond selling products. This is about persuasion, the backbone of how we persuade. I mean, how would you like to be better at persuasion? I mean, think of the essence of persuasion. What is persuasion about? It's getting people to say yes to your ideas, getting people to buy your products, of course, but, you know, getting kids to go to bed. <laughs> I mean, it's... It's so profound. It's the essence. How do you cut? You know, we come up with a great idea. Wow, what a great idea. We want to share it with somebody. Well, isn't it, isn't it a bummer if you share it with somebody and go, eh, man, that's a stupid idea, you know? It's like, well, what? You know, we were just talking about, um, you know, all the movies that are uh, the Marvel comic movies, okay? So I was talking to a friend and I said, there are just too many movies out there. I think people are getting tired of it. He said, no, no, that's not the reason. You don't know what you're talking about. It really pissed me off. So I got an article this morning that came from the CEO of uh, of uh, Disney saying exactly what I said. I said, well, hey, he doesn't agree with you, <laughs> you know, and but it's just persuasion is so powerful because if we get ideas, if we get inspired or if we invent a product or we get an idea for a product, it wouldn't it be great if you can get people to say, whoa, that's a great idea. And that's persuasion as the backbone of this. So let me give you... <laughs> I love this. It's an old article I wrote, but somebody shared it with me. He said, oh, this is funny. Roses are red, violets are blue. 20 and one is 20. How many of you people are thinking it's 22? 20 and one is not 22. 20 and one is 21. But because roses are red, violets are blue. Uh. But it sticks to the brain, okay? There are certain things like rhyme sticks to the brain like blue. And let me show you how powerful rhyme is, okay? If the glove don't fit, you must acquit. Got O.J. Simpson off from an almost certain guilty verdict in a murder trial. Okay, he said this to the jurors. And I remember after uh, the O.J. trial, after he was found uh, not guilty, uh, a journalist was asking uh, um, two of the jurors, you know, with all that evidence against O.J., there was a ton of evidence against him. With all that evidence against O.J., why did you find him not guilty? And one of them responded while the other one nodded her head in agreement. And she said, we knew if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. And the glove didn't fit. So we had to acquit. Those of us who saw the trial saw OJ put on a rubber glove and then pretend that glove, exaggerate how that glove didn't fit him. But if the glove don't fit, you must acquit sticks to the brain. And when we think of, um, you know, there are just so many phrases. <laughs> there are so many tools of brain glue that it's amazing. Like, that's a rhyme tool. And I've got tons of examples of rhyme. But let me give you another one. How about trigger words like stupid, okay? Do we like saying stupid to people? No, it's kind of insulting, isn't it? And yet stupid can make our phrases really connect. And let me give you two examples. Kiss. We say that in marketing and in selling. Keep it simple, stupid. If they said keep it simple, would it resonate with the brain as much as keep it simple, stupid? Uh, President uh, Bill Clinton uh um james cameron uh james um uh carville was his uh marketing guy who was helping him get elected president it was either elected or re-elected president of the united states and he said it's the economy stupid and he said because he used the word stupid it's the economy stupid ever it stuck to everybody's brain i mean i asked people today i said Okay, James Carville, he said, it's the economy. And they would say, stupid, <laughs> you know, it sticks to the brain. The whole phrase sticks to the brain. How about dirty, okay? Would you take a product and put dirty on it as the name of your product? Well, how about if you're writing a movie? You want people to remember your movie? You remember Dirty Dancing? Dwight, you love musicals, okay? Dirty Dancing, okay? <laughs> Do you think it was called Fancy Dancing or Out of Your Way Dancing? It would be as successful as Dirty Dancing? How about Dirty Harry? Well, Dirty okay. Dancing sexualized it, right? Exactly. By putting dirty in front of it. Run naked through the. Yeah. <laughs> but it, 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 words are powerful. But I've been saying that for decades that people need to understand that words are the most powerful tool that we have. 
And wordsmithing is something they need to start teaching people in elementary school, all the way up to being an adult into our senior years into passing, right? Words are powerful. They control so the like narrative. A, how would you like to be a young kid who has almost no money? You borrow some money from your dad, you start a business and you become a billionaire with the help of one word. So what does Richard Branson, Madonna and olive oil have in common? Virgin. Yeah, there you go. Like a virgin. Yeah, da, yeah, yeah. yeah. Da, 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 that help. that that changed the face of music in in eighty two. It, it it turned her into a blockbuster. Okay. Oh yeah. Virgin olive oil. Okay. How about Virgin Airlines? He started with Virgin Records. He actually started with a magazine, and he started Virgin Records. It's all sexualized. It's all sexual though. That's the thing. And people people are sexual creatures by nature. We want to propagate. We don't realize how powerful that word entices us and incur. It, I, bear, I guarantee we check people's b blood pressure. If you start talking with dirty words, their blood pressure goes up, <laughs> or their heart true. rate goes up, or their if you put them under only, an MRI, their brain would be just flipping out. But it isn't only dirty words. Stupid is not a dirty word. Okay. Well, so something are, that that, that is words. shocking. Yes, a shock yeah, trigger shocking. words. Yeah. So. So I was watching um, uh, a thing on the bio, a biography channel. I recorded it. And, I, and we go through some of them. I don't know this person. I don't like it and everything else. They had Bobby Flay. And I'm going, Bobby uh -huh. Flay. The name Food sounds, Channel. Yeah, a Food Channel. Exactly. The name sounds kind of familiar. Okay. He's a chef. He's a famous chef. How did he become famous? On the Food Network, he created a, a TV show. What was the name of the show? Boy Meets Grill. Not boy meets girl, boy meets grill. He took a phrase, boy meets girl, and twisted it because he was talking about how they grill, all grilled foods. What about Jamie Oliver? I was going to say that. The naked Oliver, chef. The naked yeah. chef. <laughs> what, is he running naked? No, but he used the word the naked chef. <laughs> Goes with your words about dirty. You know? Yeah, but, I mean, but it's it, we're enticed by things that make us go, our brain just goes, what? Because we're on a, we're, we're literally on... When I think about it, so many people's brains are stuck once to become adults, even older youth on a hamster wheel. They just get stuck there, go to work, go home, get paid. They do the same thing. They live for the weekends and they, they live for their addictive personalities on the weekend and regret Mondays because they're thinking about it Sundays. And they just get so anything that takes them out of their wheelhouse and forces them into the into the shoulder of the road where it's uncomfortable because there's gravel spitting up or they get a little uneasy on their vehicle, something that's going to teeter their mindset to me is why marketing with words like you're talking about works and why people haven't thought about it sooner. And I know it's been around for a long time, but there's a lot of people that still don't utilize it. Well, here... Here's how brain glue works, okay? First, I came up with some phrases. So I'll share two phrases with you. But I think it's more powerful when I give you a metaphor because metaphor is a, is a brain glue tool as well. And it's very powerful. You know, like men are from Mars, women are from Venus is a metaphor. But so the first tool, the first phrase I came up with was switch your pitch if you want to get rich. And the second one I came up with, so that was the first one, okay? I was saying rich, help you get rich. Okay, well, switch pitch, those rhyme. I can put them together. The second tool I came, the second phrase I came up with was brain glue shows you how to light the fire of desire in your buyer. Okay. And what made, what, how I came up with it was I said, I really want to boost desire. Well, what rhymes with desire? Buyer. Oh yeah. But the fire, light the fire of desire in your buyer, which actually helps uh, create a picture of this. Okay. But so I want to give you an example of, uh, Oh, so first, how brain glue works. Then I finally came up with a metaphor. The reason I came up with a metaphor was, I this metaphor is I was t I was talking to these three women who were very religious, and I figured I'd tell them a joke. Jokes, by the way, are a brain glue tool too. You know, if you make people laugh, laughers are buyers. Okay, most of the time. And so I came up with this joke, and I said, so uh, I was telling these women. A little girl came up to her mommy and said, "Mommy." Daddy says we came from apes, but you say we came from Adam and Eve. And she says, honey, daddy's talking about his family. I'm talking about my family. Okay. <laughs> so I told that joke and they laughed and all that yeah. stuff. 
But then I realized if I told them the joke a second time, they weren't going to laugh the same way the first time they heard it would be because it, it, doesn't, tr it doesn't trigger it the same way. And I'm really understanding triggers, okay? And brain glue is about triggering the brain so it wakes up. So here's an example of how brain glue works, okay? And it's a quite a vivid example, I think. So you leave your home, you're driving down the street past all these homes or apartments, wherever you live, okay? You're not going to look at everyone and say, oh, look at that house, look at that house, look at that. And you, you drive past it every day. You don't look at them anymore, you know? But one day... You're driving, you get in your car, you start driving down the street and two houses down, you see flames coming out of your neighbor's window. You're going to go, huh? What? Does he know his house is on fire? You know, am I going to call 911? Uh, is he going to burn down my house? You know, like <clears throat> you, it, it, the flames coming out of the window wake up your brain. And that's what we want is, you know, if you're writing a book, you want flames coming out of your book your book title. If you're selling a product, you want flames coming out of your product or the name of your product. So let me give you some examples of blockbusters, okay? So how about a, a mom and her son who live in Utah, um, America, and they have no business experience, but within less than two years, they sold $100 million worth of their product. $100 million, that's not bad, eh? For someone who has no business experience, how did they do that? Well, the mom was having trouble in the bathroom. And when she goes to the bathroom, they recognize that it's better for her body if she can raise her feet about six inches off the ground when she's on the toilet. I don't want to get too much into this, but okay. And so they came up with this little toilet stool idea. And, and they said, you know, this would really be great. It would help a lot of people when they go to the bathroom if they had a little toilet stool. So we have to come up with, with a name for the product. Well, we're not going to call it the toilet stool. My wife said they should have called it the stool stool, but I don't think that really works. Okay. But so toilet stool, that doesn't sound very good. Toilet stool. What's another name for toilet? Potty. Okay. I'm sitting on a potty and I'm kind of squatting. Squatty potty. Let's call it the squatty potty rhyme. Triggers with the brain. Okay. Almost makes you laugh. I'll give you another example in a second, but it really makes you laugh. But like what? But squatty potty. They, they sold like gangbusters. They started making tons of money. They couldn't believe how much money the cash was coming in. You know, millions of dollars of cash was coming in of people buying their product. They actually made it to Shark Tank. And uh, almost all the people, the investors in the Shark Tank, wanted to invest in them. A, because they're making money. But B, because Squatty Potty, it triggers the brain. They were like, that's a cool name. That's a cool name for a product. So let me give you another a metaphor first, and then I'll give you a, to, a to, tor, torture story, okay? <laughs> so Paul Tran invented an electric razor to, to shave man's private areas. I don't know if I'm getting you. You brought up the idea of private areas. I oh, it there. doesn't bother me. Go on. Okay. <laughs> but he came up with an electric razor to shave man's private areas, okay? And he said, I need to come up with a name that doesn't does not offend people but that they still understand what the product does. So he's sitting and thinking, he must have been brainstorming with some friends or something and came up with this, one of the tools I say, it's just like what, okay? Come up with a metaphor or analogy or simile, okay? What's it like? It's like a lawnmower. <laughs> Why don't I call it the lawnmower? In fact, he loved the name so much, he changed the name of his company, so it became Manscaped. We're gonna landscape a man with a lawnmower. He sold like crazy, like gangbusters. People started buying in a store. It has a, a picture of the lawn. Uh, it has the, the lawnmower, the razor, and it says the lawnmower with an arrow. Then when you, people go like, what? They you know, flames coming out of his ad. They go up and they look at it and they read it. Okay, it's, it's, it's a lawnmower to shave man's private areas. Oh, okay, interesting. So if I bought the lawnmower, I haven't, but if I bought the lawnmower, I wouldn't share it with my friend. Let's start there, okay? But I'd share this story. I, I could see calling my friend and saying, you know, one of my best friends is saying, hey, guess what I just bought? What'd you buy? I bought the lawnmower. What, you have to low, mow your lawn? No, no, no. It shaves man private areas. And it's called the lawnmower. He'd start laughing and say, hey, Mary, talk of his wife or his girlfriend. Guess what James just bought? The lawnmower. Why? He has to mow his lawn? No. You know, you share the name. And his sales exploded with this wacky name the lawnmower in fact braun was trying to buy him out and he said no you're not offering me enough money because he's making it when you got millions of dollars coming in it's fantastic so how about this terror story okay 
how would you like to invent an incredible product and someone you hate steals the idea from you and makes a ton of money, millions, almost billions of dollars from it, and you're struggling so much you decide to not even sell it anymore because you can't make, nobody's buying your product, everybody's buying his product. How would you like someone to steal your idea and make a ton of money while you struggle? No? Yes? Of course <laughs> Let me you give wouldn't. you an example. <clears throat> Post versus Kellogg's, okay? Kellogg's cornflakes and all that stuff and Post cereals. So Post is competing with Kellogg's. And so the head of Post cereals came up with this idea. And they said, um, let's create this little cake. It's kind of cool. So people can have it for breakfast or snacks. We'll put jelly inside it, like strawberries, blueberries, raspberries inside it. And you'll put it in your toaster. And it'll come out of the toaster nice and warm. And you have this little cake. And let's call it Country Squares. So they were really, they were so pr proud of it, this new product they had that three months before they launched it, they started telling the media, we have this new product we're launching in just a few months called Country Squares. And look at this. It pops out of the toaster. And it just tastes fantastic. You get this nice warm cake. So the head of Kellogg's was like, oh, what an amazing product. Guys, 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 got all the people in the company. Figure out how to make that product, okay? He's launching it in three months. Figure out how to make that product immediately, okay? Then he wanted to come up with a name. So it pops out of the toaster. So we should call it Pop Something. And back then, Andy Warhol was famous, who was a pop artist. So he said Pop Art, Pop Tart. Let's call it Pop Tart. It uses a multiple brain to glue tools. One of the brain glue tools is called uh, anchoring. Take something that's already anchored inside the brain. Pop art was anchored in the brain and connect and use that or twist it. So, and also uh, sense elevation, okay? Pop tart, it pops out of the toaster. And it's a brilliant name. Pop tarts, he launched it one week before, before post launch country squares, okay? Of course. He knew when they were launching it. Sales exploded. It became, by the way, Pop-Tarts is the largest selling product that Kellogg's has ever sold, okay? By far. Sales exploded. And they sold out within a week. They sold out in every single store that had Pop-Tarts sold out. And so he ran full page ads in major newspapers like the New York Times and stuff like that saying, we apologize. We didn't realize how much you would love this. So just hold on for about a week and we'll, more Pop-Tarts will be available. So you think people bought Country Squares? No, they waited for Pop-Tarts to be available and they went and they bought Pop-Tarts. Within six months, Post stopped even trying to sell Pop-Tarts. They just, guys, let's stop making it because so many people were buying Pop-Tarts and nobody was buying Country Squares. And that's why the more powerful, a pro, you know, the better a name you have, the more it triggers the brain, the more you have flames coming out of your product or your product name, the more likely it is that you're going to actually do really well selling your products or ideas. There are tons of these. <laughs> okay, you like uh, trigger words, okay? <laughs> so Carrie Smith, you're going to probably know what company this is as I start explaining this. So Carrie Smith started a manufacturing company, and he started making some pretty good money. And he had a friend who was selling re these really huge fans for farms. You know, in a barn... You're not going to put an air conditioning. You're going to, you know, if you have for cows or horses in your farm, in your barn, you'll put a big fan inside it. So he bought this company from his friend who had, was making really big fans. He was doing well. And he was talking to somebody and the person says, well, is it a, a big fan? No, no, it's a, it's a big ass fan. A big ass fan? Yeah, yeah. That's not just a big fan. It's a big ass fan. And his friend started laughing. And so he was running an ad and he said, what if I call it big ass fans in the ad? And sales exploded. And he went, wait a second. Maybe I should change the name of the company to Big Ass Fans. And he has a funny logo. He has a donkey with his butt facing you. And his face is in the uh, uh, far away from you, turned looking at you also. And it's Big Ass Fans, okay? Sales exploded. And I mean exploded. I'll tell you how much they exploded in a second. So what he did was... Um, he started offering other products as well as big ass fans because the were, sales were exploding. And he realized these other products are distracting me from fans. I need to just focus on fans. And he sells fans for like big warehouses and things like that. I mean, they sell, you know, they, they use them all over the place. His fans are really quite large. After 15 years, he decided to retire because he was making so much money. And he decided, I think I'm going to take time off. 
He sold his company for $500 million, big ass fans. Okay. How many people have a company for 15 years and you're lucky if you can get any money for your company? This guy sold it and he got half a billion dollars for his, the mm -hmm. company, all because he came up, I mean, he was inventive, but all because he came up with the name Big Ass Fans. And this is why Brain Glue is so important. How many of you, how many of us, you know, come up with a really great idea or a product? You have a really great product, but you struggle. I can't tell you how many people, you know, you change the name, you tweak the name, and suddenly sales explode. Let me give you an example of when I first learned Brain Glue, okay? And it wasn't called Brain Glue yet. But when I first started realizing all these patterns and how they work, the brain patterns. So I had a client. It was, it was one of the cool things about being a consultant is you end up practicing on your clients, okay, as well as yourself. And so I had these three guys who are partners in a, in a construction company. And I have no experience in, a constru in construction, but I really... <clears throat> Let me tell you what I did for them, okay? After 10 years, they had 2 million in sales. It sounds like a lot, right? 2 million in sales after 10 years? Ha, ha, ha. In one year, I took them <clears throat> to 10 million of sales in one year. And 32 million, they reached two, two years later. <clears throat> Excuse me. How did I do that? Okay, I that's where I realized, like, oh, this stuff works. This, like, works. I can't believe it. I took a whiteboard. I love whiteboards. And I said, let's make a shopping list of all the different types of clients you work with over the past 10 years. It took them 10 years to reach 2 million in sales. So he said, okay, great, great, great. Okay, so what else? This one, this one, that one. Okay. <clears throat> I said, now let's play a game. Let's pretend you're only going to go after one type of client and you're going to say no to everybody else. And they said, hey, we don't want to do that. We, you know, we, we have all these people coming in and giving us business. I, I understand that. But let's play this game. Let's get you focusing just on one type of client. They said, okay, it took a while. And they finally said, fire restoration for insurance companies. We had one insurance company that gave us two of their clients. <clears throat> Excuse me. And one of them had one client. And it was like, whenever there's they have a client that has a fire, they need a construction company to go in. And when we go in, we do two things. The first thing we do is we check to see if the frame is damaged. If the frame of the building is, is damaged, you have to tear down the whole building. But if it's not damaged, <clears throat> sorry, I got my throat here. But if it's not damaged, then we just have to fix up the building, make sure it's not going to catch fire again and, you know, fix it up for the client. And so it would be kind of fun if we could do fire restoration for insurance companies. So I said, okay. So now applying brain glue, I said, what's the first word that, you know, what's the first word that they think of if they have a client that has a fire? Fire, the word fire. Why don't we call you guys the fire extinguisher for insurance companies? And we'll come up with a website called firex.com. So I went with them to the first two prospects they were going to, because I wanted to make sure they were going to apply it. Because, you know, people, we get ideas all the time, but we don't, what a great idea, but we don't implement it, okay? I mean, like if you came up with the, <laughs> the uh, uh, lawnmower, you'd laugh like yeah. crazy. Would you actually name your product a lawnmower? Okay. So I went in with them. And we started talking to the prospect and we said, yeah, just think of us as your fire extinguisher. We're your fire extinguisher. We won't put out the fire, but we'll fix it after. So we're your fire extinguisher. Just go to firex.com and get us calling, you know, call us. They started laughing, the prospects. Well, it's one of the things about great brain glue. Laughers are often buyers. The phone started ringing off the hook. Every time somebody, you know, every, every time one of these insurance companies had a, a client with a fire, who did they think of first? The fire extinguisher. Okay, I got to call my fire extinguisher. And then sales exploded. They went from two to 10 million in sales. And in fact, I remember they said, uh, you know, they said, hey, it was supposed to be 12 million. So I said, let's come up with a goal. I said, okay, 12 million. <laughs> so they reached only 10 million. So one of the one of the guys said to me, hey, Bond, it was supposed to be uh, 12 million. And my response was, shut up. They, they, they had so millions of dollars coming in the door. They couldn't believe how rich they bought. They had so much money. They bought the biggest BMW for each one of them as a gift, like three BMWs. You know, <laughs> they're Beamer guys, you know. But I mean, it just and then they went to 32 million two years later. But why? Be to me, it's 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 freaky. Because it seems subtle. I'll go back to John Gray, who wrote Men, Women, and Relationships and changed the title to Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. He sold 20,000 copies of Men, Women, and Relationships. But just by changing the name, 
he went to from 20,000 to 50 million. 50 million. How'd you like to sell 50 million of anything? Make a buck mm -hmm. each? I'll take that. I'll take 50 cents each. But just because he changed the title, it's subtle, and yet it's, st it's stuff that sticks to the brain, makes it easier for people to buy your product or service. And there are a lot of, so many people who have, this is what's so great about brain glue. This is not about people who are rich. This is not, if you're rich, okay, fine, okay? This is if you don't have a lot of money, but you want to come up with a name for your product that makes it easy to win clients. And think of, um, a lot of people know Famous Amos, okay? Wally Amos came up with Famous Amos Cookies. He wasn't rich, but the name Famous Amos stuck to the brain. And because it stuck to the brain. I'll give you a, a good example, okay? Of the famous, Wally Amos was on Shark Tank. And I saw this. It was really sad, okay? And then I said, well, he if he knew brain glue, he wouldn't have had this problem. So Wally Amos created Famous Amos Cookies. They're really good cookies. And then he made a lot of money and he sold it to some friends for a million dollars. And they sold it to Pillsbury for $30 million. And he was a little pissed off because hey, they made a lot more money than me, but that's so it happens, so be it, okay? You know, million dollars, you got a million dollars, get over it, okay? Although a million dollars can go fast if you just you know, want to spend it. But so he was on Shark Tank and he said, I have a new type of cookie. It's really a great cookie. They said, okay, great. Well, what is it? It's whatever the name was, Joe, you know, fancy cookies or something. And he and they loved him. They said, but he said, I can't use my name, Famous Amos, because that's what was trademarked, and they own the trademark. And I, they can't use my face. I can't use my face on my thing, because my face is part of the trademark for Famous Amos, also. And so the people on Shark Tank loved him, and people love him. He's a really likable guy, but they didn't invest in him. And I was realizing, if you knew Brain Glue, then you would have easily had them all invest in you. How? Okay, you can't use the word famous Amos, but your name is Wally Amos. So why don't we use Wally? Why don't we call it Wally Balls? Sounds like volleyballs. Okay, Wally Balls make little cookies in the shape of balls, which I'm sure he could because he loves cookies and can make them all different ways. And on the on the front of the of the uh, package, put the back of your head, not the front of your head, the back of your head with an arrow, and then on the back of the product it says. Hi, my name is Wally Amos. I created a famous cookie that you probably know. But because of that, I'm not allowed to put my face on the front of the uh, on the front of the uh, the product. But I wanted you to know that I'm still Wally Amos and that's the back of my head. People would have laughed that ba Wally balls would have resonated with them. And they, you know, they would have gone, hey, this is by the same guy that does famous Amos cookies, you know, Wally balls. This is really great. And he would have and they would have stood in line to buy it. And as, as people would have bought it and had fun buying it. When you understand the power of, you know, of brain glue, I mean, I'll, let me give you an example with um, um, J.B. Weld. I was reading about this. J.B. Weld is one of the strongest glues that's out there, industrial glues. Okay. It's really great. But who do you think sells more than J.B. Weld? Gorilla glue. <laughs> Gorilla glue. You know, they were competing with super glue, okay, which is a good name, super glue. But they went, we want, we're even stronger than super glue. What's, what makes you think of something strong? Uh, gorilla, strong as a gorilla. Let's call it gorilla glue. And the rest, as they say, is history. I went to a Home Depot and I was looking at it because I know the story of them. I said, hey, I wonder if they sell gorilla glue and, and JB Weld. And yeah, gorilla glue has like this whole column of products that they sell. And J.B. Weld has like three different little products of J.B. Weld that they sell. And I said to a guy in the store, is J.B. Weld better than Gorilla Glue? He said, yeah, it's a lot better. Isn't it funny that J.B. Weld has only three little products they're selling, but Gorilla Glue has this whole column of products. And it's because they understood that if you can trigger the right sides of the brain, the emotion sides of the brain, you have a much better chance of making a ton of money. Well, mean, since, you bring, so, since you bring that up, we'll take a little... You're, thanks for sharing all those great stories, but you brought up something. Um, your your ability to tell stories and share has gone through about three quarters of what I was going to ask you, which is awesome. Uh -oh. The flow is you're you're great at it. The flow is great, but you brought up about the right brain. One of the things that I was reading is you know the left and right brain and the way of thinking and how it affects what we sell. 
right? So most people figure the right side is more emotional, left side is more logical. But unfortunately, so many people today are technical. They're very logical. Thus, it gives them a marketing disadvantage, obviously, which you've talked about a little bit when it comes to persuasion through marketing. So how does a person get past that? Because you mentioned as well that you've had people that even though you teach them and tell them like whatever, they're still so logically stuck in their thought processes. How does a person that's too left brain, too logical get out of their own way? Now, this is very important what you're asking. This is for logical people. Okay. Do not turn off your logic. Okay. But start with logic. So the toilet stool lady. Okay. She started with logic. What is this? This is a toilet stool. Okay. You always start with logic. Don't turn off your logic. Start with logic. Because logic is what makes us able to create great products and services in the first place. You know, because we're able to solve a problem or create something that we think is going to be valuable for someone. So you always start with logic. But once you start with logic, now you start doing your brain glue tools. And so one of the brain glue tools is find words that uh, rhyme with what you have, okay? Okay. Uh, or find other words that relate to it. Like she recognized the toilet stool is not really a good name, toilet. You know, I mean, what are you going to call it? The poopy stool? No, we don't want to call it that, you know, but we want it to the toilet stool. And so you start playing with the words. Well, what's another word for toilet is potty. Oh, potty, you know, and potty sticks to the brain. Like porta potty. I'm driving under a bridge with one of my grandsons who's like six years old. And I point it up and I said, hey, you know what that is? He said, yeah, it's a porta potty. He's six years old and he knows what a porta potty is. Okay. It's porta potty because it sticks to the brain. You know, it becomes easy. So you always start with logic and then you start applying the brain glue tools. You know, it's just like a metaphor is a good one to start with. You know, this electric razor is just like, I don't know, it's like a lawnmower. Yeah, if you're going across the lawn. Huh, interesting. And start with that and be as crazy as possible because logic cuts us down and says, well, I couldn't call my product that. Give yourself a chance to be as crazy as possible. It's just like a guy running naked through my lawn. Oh, man, I don't know what that is, but, you know, but have fun with it. And this is the secret, okay? I, I'm i old enough to, to, I attended Zig Ziglar uh, seminars, okay? Zig Ziglar, motivational speaker. Who was Amazing. Famous. Yeah, he was, and it, was, it changed my life. It absolutely changed my life. He did. And he said, um, selling is nothing more than a transference of passion. If you're passionate about something and you, you, you love musicals, I, nobody has to teach you how to sell musicals. You have to say, oh man, you got to see Sound of Music. It's like the most amazing, you know, I don't have to teach you how to sell. You know how to sell because you're transferring your passion to me. Okay. And so when we come up with a product, don't we get proud of it? It's like, you know, when the guy came up with uh, uh, Country Squares, you know, he was proud of it. Like, wow, this is fun. But he came up with a stupid name. You know, you want to, I mean, it's not a stupid, stupid name, but it, it it doesn't trigger passion. You People buy for emotional reasons. You know, we say no, like, and trust because it's passion. There's, you know, if you don't like a person, are you going to buy from them? Probably not. I don't care how great their product is. You're probably not going to buy from them. So what you want to do is you want to trigger passion. When you create a product, logically come up with the name my book and i'll give you let me give you a personal story okay my book was not originally called brain glue okay my book i'm i don't even follow my own process listen to this okay you know what my book was called sell more with a right brain marketing strategy and i remember i presented to jack, uh, to jack canfield and jack canfield sold 500 million chicken soup for the soul books and so i wanted to get a famous person to at least look at my book he started looking and hopefully give me a testimonial. So he started, it was called sell more with the right brain marketing strategy back then. He started looking at the book and I have a great video. So he didn't just say it to me. I got it on video, which is awesome. Um, but he said, your book blew my mind. He said, I, I started reading your book and I couldn't put the damn thing down. I got like 14 books to read that I'm sort of reading all these different books and I just couldn't put your book down. He said, it's fantastic. And I, you know, I, He's, you know, I, I apologize. Oh, I'm sorry it did that. You know, you couldn't put my book down. Could I get that as a testimonial? And he said, on one condition, you got to change the name of your damn book. You know, 
This whole book is about brain glue and you're calling it sell more than right brain marketing strategy. What a stupid name. You're teaching us how to be emotional sellers and you're selling with logic. Stop it. <laughs> you need to change it. I'm like, do I have to? He said, yes. I'll give you testimonials. I'll give you tons of testimonials. I love this book. I'm forcing everybody in my company. I bought copies for everybody in my company and I'm forcing them to read it and apply it to all the things that we do in business. So he, he's got lots of money. So he makes he has a lot of business going. But only if you change it, the brain glue. This is a book about brain glue. Stop with that. But he was right. You know, I mean, it was just I, I, the the logic, the logical person in us comes out. But we, so we have to let that come out first. OK, don't hide it. We're logical. But from that point, we got to trigger the emotion centers of the brain. I saw this guy who had a T-shirt that said life sucks and then you die. And I'm like, no. No, this is life right now. It's going to be fun. So you're from Canada, Edmonton, okay? Let me give you a story. I love this story. <laughs> so I'm from Montreal originally. So um, whenever I heard, when we were young kids, when we heard the word Regina, Saskatchewan, we would laugh like crazy. Because what does Regina sound like? Regina. Vagina. <laughs> so we go, uh -huh. Regina? So Regina let's say you're a head of marketing because this is the head of marketing for this for the um tourism for regina saskatchewan came up with this out of the world uh slogan okay <laughs> and it was so hot and so unusual that it it literally tripled their tourism industry okay they eventually apologized after like two and a half years they said we're sorry we didn't think we we're gonna offend people like yeah right okay madonna at a concert and Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones at a concert, it's so funny that they actually use the slogan of Regina for their audience and their audience laughs, okay? So what was the slogan? Regina, it rhymes with fun. <laughs> that was the slogan. It's an advertising slogan. Oh, well, you don't need to say anything stickers. else. It does, you don't, your brain automatically fills in the blank. Exactly, exactly. Regina, yeah. it rhymes with fun? <laughs> And people and they'd say, they would go to Regina's website, Regina, and they say, yes, Regina rhymes with fun. And they would talk about how Regina is like, I don't know if it's in the Rockies or where it is, but they literally tripled tourism with that slogan. Eventually, they stopped. Ha ha. Yeah, you know, or, 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 Regina isn't a place that I would think is a tourist mecca. And they're, nowhere, and, and they're nowhere close to the mountains. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so let me give you another example. Music, if you love music, okay? Yeah, I do. This is to me is profound. It shows you how powerful this is. Brain glue is so powerful that when you use it, even if you don't mean to, you sell. Okay. I was standing on the corner of Winslow, Arizona. Such a fine sight to see. It's a girl, my lord, in a flatbed Ford, slowing down to take a look at me. That's the Eagles song. Okay. Take yeah. it easy. It's a fabulous song. Love it, love it, love it. Okay. You know what it did? It boosted, exploded the sales. The tourism sales of Winslow, Arizona. I have this woman who's in Arizona, a major city in Arizona. She said, have you ever been to Winslow? It's a hole in the wall, okay? Winslow, Arizona created a statue of a lamppost with a guy leaning on the lamppost. And above it, it says, standing on the corner. And she's telling me, yeah, they added a, a, a car, a flatbed Ford with a girl <laughs> right next to it. And people, they're driving on Route 66, which is a major route across uh, America. And they see Winslow, Arizona. Oh, well, we got to check that out. They stop at Winslow, Arizona, and they take pictures next to this statue. Of course, they buy from lunch and whatever else, so it helps the city. It's a, it's a hole in the wall. But it's, you know, the Eagles, they created this song. They didn't create the song to sell Winslow, Arizona, but it still sold it. They couldn't not sell it because it was part of a rhyme. That's how powerful Brain Glue is. It's like when you start to understand it, you start to realize, like, wow. Virgin Virgin Airlines, like wow, Virgin Records, yeah, 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 let's join them, you know. I mean, it's just when you understand the power of these brain triggers, the brain triggers are there. When you understand the power of brain triggers, then you have to, you know, you go like, Oh, I gotta use this. And so, it just really, really helps. So flow into you know, you, you talked about it how it can help, and then we a little bit we touched on. How does it work in utilizing it for moms and dads? Because dad's parent as well. <laughs> I was a single parent for many years of five kids. So 
how does it how does it work in the ability to make a kid go to bed or make a kid do their chores or their homework explain okay, that here please. we go here we go i gotta give you this woman gave me toy you know they torture me sometimes this woman comes up to me and says you're an expert in brain glue can you help me with my kids i'm like oh sure i, I can try you know she says so first i have two twins and a 13 year old okay young twins and a 13 year old and the twins, I read them a story and they want another story and another story, another story. I can never get them to bed. So we brainstormed back and forth and she came up with a, we came up with a rhyme. And the rhyme was, when the story's read, we go to bed. And so she went in and she talked to the kids and she said, okay, when the story's read, we go to bed, okay? They said, mommy, read us a story. She said, okay, when the story's read, we go to bed, right? And they said, okay. So, so she read them a story and said, hey, mommy, mommy. You know, can you read us another story? And they said, uh uh, when the story's read. And they said, we go to bed. Okay, mommy. And th so she came back to me and said, hey, it works. So I got a tougher one for you. <laughs> it's like, oh, great, thanks. She said, I said, what's that? She said, my 14 year old said, mommy, why do we have to follow so many rules in life? Hmm, okay. So the first thing I, I brainstormed with her, the first thing we came up with is what rhymes with rules? How about fools? Only fools don't follow rules. Okay, so that's one way to start it. But let's add a metaphor and make it even stronger. So, okay, so we brainstormed and came up with one. And then I sat down with her, her and her son and I said, so you asked your mom why we have to follow so many rules in life, right? And he said, yeah. I said, okay, well, think about it. When you're thirsty, you could drink out of the toilet, but why would you want to? Remember, only fools don't follow rules. He looks at me and he goes, no, that makes sense. First, the, getting a 13-year-old to say that anything makes sense is a miracle. So I escaped before he asked me any other questions. But does it really make sense? Or did I simply trigger the emotion centers of the brain so it feels like it makes sense? Let me give you two political examples that do this, okay? Anchoring. You take two things that don't normally come together and you put them together, okay? Um, so... Uh, you can't hug a child with nuclear arms. Okay? <laughs> You're nodding your head. I mean, a lot of you are going, okay. They don't, they don't really fit together, but they and I fit them together. Hugging a child makes you, it's an emotional connection. Nuclear arms, totally different emotion. You can't hug a child with nuclear arms. Hmm, okay. How about this one? Okay. And this is not for everybody who's pro or anti-gun. This is not about that. I'm just fascinated because it uses a brain glue tool. But I heard a comedian say the line, the right to bear arms is almost as crazy as the right to arm bears. Okay, that uses something called chiasmus, which is a flip. Okay, it's like I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. Okay, it's a flip. It's <laughs> like uh, um, if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. My wife hates that song. Okay, from Crosby, Stills and Nash. Do not follow that. Do not sing. That. Okay. But I mean, it, President John F. Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. You know, that uses chiasmus to flip. Uh, he also said, uh, mankind must put an end to war or war will put an end to mankind. When you hear a phrase like that, it sticks. Uh, uh, Malcolm X, a black uh, civil rights activist, people loved him because of for what he stood for. But some of the things that he said, he said, you know, he could easily say, you have no idea how hard it is being a black person in America, in certain parts of America, okay? And people will go, yeah, you know, they can relate or whatever. What he said instead was, um, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock. The rock landed on us. Hmm, interesting. He had another phrase that a lot of people don't realize he said it. He came up with this, but he said, when you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. These are profound lines that stick because of chiasmus. So here's in Southern California, we have a hamburger uh, restaurant, okay? They use chiasmus, a flip, and trigger words, okay? A trigger phrase. So you're competing with McDonald's and Burger Kings and Wendy's, okay? And so you want you, you, you rent a location, you got a restaurant. You can't, it's, you can't afford to have a big restaurant where people can sit down, but you can make it a drive-through, okay? And you offer hamburgers, they're really good hamburgers, okay? I mean, that's one of the things if you have a you have to have a good product or service. If you have a crappy one, you maybe get people coming, but they won't come back or whatever. But they had a good product, but still they're competing with McDonald's and Burger Kings and Wendy's that spend like tens of millions of dollars in Southern California alone. 
So they came up with this idea. Why don't we call it in and out burgers? Well, in and out, what does that mean? That's sex, isn't it? In and out. Yeah. It's, a, it's a nickname for sex. So you're driving down the street and you see, you look up and go, in and out burgers? What the heck's that? Oh, it's a drive through In and out burgers? Let's check that out. Check it out. Hey, oh, and it's good hamburgers. You're going to go, hey, gay, you got to come to in and out burgers. It's like, it's like the, the lawnmower, okay? In and out burgers. In and Out Burgers has exploded, even though they it was a family that had like just enough money to rent a small space and get a sign made. But they came up with a name that uses chiasmus, uses a trigger and the trigger word in and out. And suddenly it, it, it's like flames coming out of the window. You're driving down the street and there's flames coming out of their sign. Like in and out, in and out burgers? What's that? And it it resonates. And that's why these tools, they're bra- they're already in our brain. And it's just when you use them, it's amazing. Let me. Can I give you a story that I think yes. how Marilyn Monroe became famous? <laughs> so brain glue works because of something that's called uh, redintegration, not reintegration, but redintegration, which is the brain's need for completion. Okay. I went to the living room. My wife was watching a TV show and I said, hey, is this any good? And she said, no, nah, it's stupid. So I said, why are you watching it? Well, I want to see how it turns out. <laughs> okay. So what's the most powerful tool of human interaction? I'm using it now, aren't I? Can you tell what I'm doing? I'm asking questions, aren't I? I talked to a group because I work with the U.S. Small Business Administration, so we'll have like sometimes 200 or 300 people in an audience. And I say, if I keep asking you a question, are you going to keep nodding your heads and answering it? I said, you're trying to stop, but you can't, can you? Huh? You know, and they go, yeah, okay. I said, even in your brain, you're nodding your head, even if your head isn't nodding. Because we're programmed to answer questions when we hear them, okay? That's redintegration is the brain's need for completion. It's why we like symmetry, okay? My wife hates asymmetrical people. She sees a guy with a lazy eye, and you can cover up half his face, and he looks like one person. You cover up the other half, and he looks like a totally different type of person because he's got a lazy eye. And that drives her nuts more than it drives me nuts. But anyway, it's symmetry. We like symmetry. Well, asymmetry stands out too. A guy with a weird eye will stand out also. So let me give you an example of how Marilyn Monroe believes she became famous. So Marilyn Monroe was born Norma Jean, I think Mortensen or something. And so it was Norma Jean. And so her manager said, change your name to Marilyn. Marilyn's more, you know, if you want to become a successful model, Marilyn's a more likable name than Norma Jean. Said, okay, fine. She named herself Marilyn Marilyn. And her stepfather, I'm pretty sure it was her stepfather, was named Monroe. So she came up with the name Marilyn Monroe, which uses alliteration, a repetition of sound. Marilyn Monroe. It's like Coca-Cola, Best Buy, TikTok. They use alliteration. It's not a coincidence, by the way. Okay? They use it and it helped them become famous. So she's Marilyn Monroe. Then she loves um, Jean Harlow, who is a, a, a massively successful actor in the early days of the movie industry. And Jean Harlow had platinum blonde hair. So she said, I'm Marilyn Monroe. If I, I should have platinum blonde hair, just like Jean Harlow. So she went to exactly the same hairdresser that Jean Harlow went to and got her hair color the same color. Okay. So now when she put it on makeup, she has a beauty mark on her cheek and she'd cover up the beauty mark. Okay. Which is, you know, what a lot of people will do. But one day she's looking at photographs of Jean Harlow and she realizes this is, wait a second, this is weird. On some photographs, Jean Harlow has a beauty mark on her cheek. And then some, it's on her chin. I bet she doesn't even have a beauty mark. I bet she's putting a dot on her face to bring attention to herself. And so what Marilyn Monroe did was, instead of hiding the beauty mark, she darkened it so it would stand out from the crowd. And she believed she became a, a, a massively famous because of that. So then we have um, Cindy Crawford. And this is in her biography. Cindy Crawford talks about this. Cindy Crawford's a supermodel, okay? She became the first massive supermodel, okay? When she, she says in her biography, when I was a kid, I have this big beauty mark over a birthmark over my left uh, um, uh, lip. And I begged my mom, please, can you take me to the doctor and get it removed? She says, I am so glad my mom never got it removed. I believe this beauty mark is the reason I became a supermodel because I stand out from the crowd. I'm this person with a dot on her face. Okay. And she was she, unique. And, and, it's, so how did I come up with this idea of looking at beauty marks of all the things? I saw this. Uh, so I, um, David Ogilvy in the early days of the movie industry is a famous advertiser. Okay. Phenomenal. And he had to come up with an ad 
for Hathaway shirts. Now, Hathaway shirts became a blockbuster of success. In fact, Warren Buffett, who I've worked with his team, Warren Buffett's company is called Berkshire Hathaway because he owns Hathaway shirts, that company, okay? But back then, let's say you're running an ad for a shirt company. It's a full page ad. So what would you do? You have a good looking guy in one of the shirts with a nice pair of pants, hopefully shoes on, in a nice background, right? So every shirt ad looks the same. A shirt ad, a guy in a shirt, guy in a shirt, guy in a shirt. So what did David Ogilvy do? He put an eye patch on the guy, just like he's a pirate. And he calls his ad, the man in the Hathaway shirt. Never explains why the guy has an eye patch. But so you're flipping through an ad, and you know, huh, shirt ad, shirt ad. Huh? What's this guy on a patch on an eye? What's that? The man in the Hathaway shirt, huh? And that sales exploded because of the man in the Hathaway shirt with the eye patch. So I saw that and I'm thinking, well, that's really powerful. It's asymmetry, okay? And I was in a church and this woman, this, this the wife of this guy I know, and I never saw his wife, has this huge beauty mark above her uh, eyebrow, one of her eyebrows. And when I looked at that, I went like, wow, that really stands out. And so I was talking to some friends and said, do you see his wife? And they went, no, I didn't. I said, she's a, she has a big beauty mark above her uh, her uh, left uh, eyebrow. Oh yeah, that woman, I saw her. It stood out to people that they, you know, and I went, wait a second. I wonder if, you know, if birthmarks or beauty marks stands out and I started doing research and suddenly there's this whole thing that women seem to know, but us guys don't know. That's like, you know, if you put a dot on your face, it'll make you stand out. So you guys out there, don't put dots on your face, but, you know, but look at um, uh, Mike Tyson, okay? If we know Mike Tyson, Mike Tyson has a tattoo on half his face. It makes him stand out from the crowd. And so this whole concept of asymmetry really becomes flames coming out of your face or whatever, <laughs> the dot. So whoever thought that the dot on Marilyn Monroe's face, is, she believes it was a huge part of why she became uh, so successful. But That's yeah, just, awesome. Great, think of great. Things like that. Great stories. So, James, if you had to give our listeners one last closing message, what would you tell them in regards to giving a heck and never giving up? Come up with a metaphor. My product or idea is just like blank and have fun with it. Come up with the craziest ideas you could think of. You know, my you know, my product is just like a naked guy running through my backyard, you know, or whatever. But have fun with it and let that be a starting point of how you describe your product or idea. And I'm willing to bet, you know, hey, I had the fire extinguisher, you know? I mean, I'm willing to bet that it will start helping you understand how you can have fun, but you can also come up with something that becomes a lot more, a lot more powerful way to sell your idea or product by helping it stick to the brain like glue. So yeah, come up with a metaphor or analogy, complete the phrase, my product or idea is just like and be as crazy as possible and write them down or record them because you're going to start laughing and go, huh, that was really funny, huh? And you go, wait a second, what did I just say? Wait, that was pretty good. You know, I get people doing it all the time. They say, We're, I'm on a conversation. They say, I'm so mad I didn't record this thing. It's because, you know, you want to come up with crazy ideas, but use them. And the more you can do that, I, you know, I'm willing to bet you're going to have fun with it, but you're also going to come up with ways to help you sell a lot more than you're selling right now. That's amazing. I appreciate that. So our time is almost up and I want to respect our listeners in your time. However, before we end, can you please tell the listeners and people watching, what's the best way to reach you? Well, yes, brainglue.com is a great place to go to. My book is on Amazon. It's in lots of bookstores and things like that. But if you go to yesbrainglue.com, there's links to Amazon, but it also talks you through a lot of the elements of brain glue. And I think you'll find helpful and, and interesting. So yes, brainglue.com is an easy way to go. Yeah. And for those people that are new to the show, go to giveaheck.com, go into the podcast part of my website. You'll see a picture of James and you'll be able to find the show notes, which I'll make sure has his social media, uh, that link to um, yesbrainglue.com. And at the end of the day, you can even get the book on Audible. I bought it last night because I want to listen to it myself. I'm a person that prefers to listen to books over opposed to reading. I read so much already that if I start reading a book, you may be like me, I start falling asleep. I, I fall asleep and the book's on my chest or it's on my head, whatever, right? So you can buy it on Audible as well. 
Um, but if you go on to Amazon, there is a link to Audible, which because they own Audible. So you'll be able to just go to a one-stop shop, go to Amazon and uh, search for the title. It's really easy, but I'll make sure the links as well in the show notes. Any last words you'd like to share with us? Any last things before yes. we close? Give a heck. That's brain glue. You know, it's your it, what a coincidence. Your name is uh, Dwight Heck. It's a good. It's a good thing. Your name is in hell. <laughs> Give well, a hell. You know? Well, no. well, people, people, you know, your name is mixed, awesome. When, when I first created the Give a Heck brand, I had people saying, "Do what the heck? This that?" But I had I had a mastermind I belonged to. Everybody had their opinions, just like we have buttholes, right? Everybody's got an opinion of what you should do. And one guy said to me, "Give a heck." And it stuck with me. And before I talked to him again, 24 hours later, he's a he's a mentor of mine. I literally had already registered the URL. I had already done all this stuff. And he reached out to me and he says, I changed my mind. That's a terrible, don't use give a heck. And I went too late, <laughs> too late. Too because late. <laughs> literally since you said it, it has stuck in my brain, brain glue, right? And I continue to build the brand um, but obviously there's a lot of things that I can utilize because I don't have specifically, you talked about, you know, as I guess, since we're chatting about this before I wrap up, you can have a product, an idea or a service really at the end of the day, I am the product, right? What I offer is a product. It can be called a service. It can be all an idea where my whole, see my book, which you can see over my shoulder, my, my best selling book that's on Amazon called give a heck how to live a life on purpose and not by accident. I was trying to think of something. What have I said to people since I was new in the industry 21 years ago, right? And people were telling me they felt like they were just, you know, they're they're like a, a flag flapping in the wind, no direction. It's going all over the place. And they felt like their life was like that. And I said, well, you're not, leave, you're not really, you're living kind of by accident, aren't you? And I always heard that phrase growing up, living on that hamster wheel. And that's how I des designed and developed. And I used those statements even before I wrote the book. But it was like a wake up call to me to really sit and be pro and think to myself, am I actually reflecting on what have I done the last 21 years for people? I'm financial services, but really I'm, financial services is the last thing I do. I'm really a life coach. I teach people how to live life on purpose and not by accident because I teach them to dig into their monsters of their life, their emotional, their financial, their physical monsters to get to a point where they live a life on purpose because if they don't get past all that stuff, no matter what I do with people with money, they're right back to where they were 90 days later, 180 days later, right? It, 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 people don't understand and they, they can't label it. So I figured accident is one of the most simplest terms that we understand. Why, why do people call it an accident? Because it's preventable. Well, how to live life on purpose, not by accident. Your life is being on that hamster wheel is preventable. So I still, I need a lot of, I need work to work on it more. Um, I don't know if it's a, a, you believe that it's something that should happen overnight. You always hear that, it, you know, when you start, create a brand, a personal brand or a new service that a business takes three to five years before it really, you know, gels, I'm in my third year. <laughs> and it's, it, and it's, it, you know, it, I keep on thinking to myself, what should I do on social media? How do I name things? How do I, I put this one little snippet, one minute snippet on a reel? And it, it, the reels that have the most profound, what you'd call brain glue, are the ones that all of a sudden, I did one that was just very simplistic. And the reel took off and it was 13,000 views, right? It was just like, and another one, which I thought would take off had like 100. You know what I mean? Like, th this thing that you've discovered or that you've been teaching on is simplistic, but yet we overcomplicate it. And I need to get out of my own way. Right, exactly. Exactly. Right. Well, also you could be with AI today, so you got all these things. But no, I just, you know, when you have a when you have a a product or a concept, you have a concept that's so profound, you want to say it in a way that registers it that triggers the brain, and it does with yours. I mean, it's just you just have a natural understanding for that. And if you just said, I mean, I, I can't even I don't even want to think of a logical way to describe it. It's emotional. It emotional emotionally triggers you. You know, I mean, living the life on purpose and not by accident. I mean, it's just, it, it just, uh, it resonates. And that's what we, you know, when you read that, you know exactly what it is. And you go, oh yeah, I, I, that's interesting. I want that. That's what I was told. But I've also had people, which I think is a minority that say, 
you know, what's the book about? And I'll say to them, well, let's read the title. Give a heck, how to live life on purpose, not by accident. And I'll say, just think about the words, right? But there's some people out there that just are word stupid, I guess. Back to that stupid word, right? They're word stupid. And you can't, all I can do is hope to attract the tribe of people that understand. And I and I think the reason, one of the reasons I finally decided to use my name, which is my legal name for those listening or watching, heck is a, 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 a last name that comes from Europe. Right from Germany specifically, so it 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 I, I didn't change my name. I was born with it. There goes back generations. Right? How many times a day do you hear the word "heck"? I interview people and they use the term "heck," right, as as a curse or an explicitive or a way to attract emotion. So I figured, give a heck. People are so inundated with that word. All of a sudden, now I have it in a title. And, you know, so I'm, I'm always trying to think and work on it in certain ways. But I think this, the, if I overcomplicate it, it's not going to help either. Wouldn't you agree that any of us that have these brands or have this, you know, ability like Pop-Tarts, they didn't overcomplicate it. They kept it simple. Brain glue. Remarkable. The reason you're on my show is because of that two words. Well, and then, so last thing. But this is important. To, I remember this phrase. Somebody told this to me, and it's really profound, okay? And is, I don't know the secret of success, although I think I do with brain glue, but I don't know the secret of success, but the secret of failure is trying to please everyone. You will never please everyone. Nobody will. There's nothing you could, you know, you could have fun. It doesn't matter what it is. Well, you brought you that up earlier. It. You got to niche down. Sometimes you brought that up earlier. Sometimes you, like you were telling one client, let's let's just focus on one thing, and that's what I've decided that I need to stop trying to please the masses of anybody. Even in my MMA, my money making activity, which is my financial practice, I want to focus on not. I want to focus on the needs of one, and if I do the needs of one really well they're going to be satisfied not living in quiet desperation. And they talk about me like my referral based business, even before my give a heck brand was phenomenal. It died off with the pandemic, but at one time I never ever marketed it. I never had a website. I never had to do nothing because I did my job effectively working with the client to make them think and li about living life on purpose, putting in a roadmap to get there that they automatically talked about people with it, people because people would notice, oh, you're happier. You're not sad all the time. Oh, we work with this great guy. He helped us figure out, you know, our money monsters. He helped us figure out what's been holding us back in life. And then he helped us put a plan together to help our life. And he spent about 20 hours with us. And it was just amazing. You know what I mean? They tell me what they tell their friends. So, you know, I take my personality, a passion, and added that to the brand. And now it's just a matter of continuing to push forward. And that's why you have to satisfy, you have to be passionate about what you do. If you're not passionate about what you do, we'll get you the t-shirt that says life sucks and then you die. We don't want that. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. it's transference of passion. If when you're passionate, if you're not passionate, I I, I was in Montreal and I started as a photographer, okay? And I was trying to do work for Avon early on in my career. And I was trying to think, what would they like? What would they like? And I created a photograph and they hated it. And I went, well, I didn't like it and they don't like it. If at least I created a photograph that I liked, then at least we knew one person was going to like it. You have to. And when I did that, suddenly my sales exploded and people started loving my work because I was passionate about it. So we have to be passionate about what we have. And then once I agree. We, do that, we transfer the passion to other people. And so, you know, we logically come up with something. Oh, hey, I have the solution for it. Then we get proud of ourselves. Hey, that's really cool. Look at how that works. You just screw these things. Isn't that fun? Wow. Now you want to transfer that passion. Brain glue helps you transfer that passion. I Everything, can't wait. Whatever, but brain glue I is can't a tool, wait to listen to it. That's what you do. You want to transfer that passion. When you transfer that passion, your life fits together. They but your tonality, so your, tonality your tonality, your tonality brings out passion. You think you have fun telling people, but hey, guess what I sell? This. Yeah. So, oh, and that's that. It's the lawnmower. It's the lawnmower? Mm -hmm. What? I mean, mm -hmm. He must have a riot at parties. Okay. Absolutely. But your passion though comes across in your tonality, like you personally. Just all the stories you shared, even if it's a third party thing where you're talking about somebody else and what they've done, a company, you're passionate about your craft. 
right? Which is awesome. And you're right. You have to be passionate. That's why one of the speeches I do on stage and people can actually find it on YouTube. It's only just shy of 14 minutes. It's titled 2008 was the worst year of my life. And it was a reset wow. that I went through. That's what it's 2008 was the worst, best, worst year of my life. And I get people that reach out to me and go like, I had to watch it. And they can watch a, sh a short four minute reel of it, or they can watch the full 14 minutes. And I got up on stage and I had it professionally recorded where I was doing this speech. And it literally just talks about the fact that I wasn't doing what I was supposed to do myself. And that's why when you said, when, when Jack Canfield said, well, you know, why aren't you doing your own stuff? And you realized you're not even doing your own stuff with the title of your book. I had forgotten about the most important person, me. I wasn't doing everything I needed to do to live the life on purpose. I had let myself get lazy and I'd been in the industry for six years and the crash of the housing market hit. And it was just a giant wake up call. And one day when I was asked, it said, it said you need to, this is what we want you to speak on. And this was in the beginning of 2021. I had to do it in the fall of 2021 at Salt Lake City, just outside of Salt Lake in uh, Sandy, Utah. And I literally, I thought, you know what? I, and I struggled. So I just asked a couple of friends of mine, what would you write about? We started having a conversation. They didn't even answer my question. It was just like all of a sudden, bing, 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 <laughs> light bulbs went off. You got to reset. You lost your passion. You lost your focus of why you did this. You got comfortable. And I think that happens to a lot of people, right? They get stuck in a rut, right? They camp in their mindset. They forget to climb. And by talking to others, having that communication with you, I'm, I've just got a million different things going on now too. Just like the same thing that happened to me in 2021 when I was challenged to come and speak, right? At, about a topic. And it was my choice, but they wanted me to, it had to be something that was emotionally charged to a person's purposeful life, to their life of living comfortably, because without money, you can't live comfortably if you're broke. Right. Right. You're living on that hamster wheel. So I appreciate yeah. your time, brother. This has been a fabulous conversation. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So thanks so much for sharing and being on Give a Heck, James. I appreciate your time and sharing some of your experiences so that others too can learn it is never too late to give a heck. Thank you for taking time out of your day and listening to Give a Heck. If you find value, I'd appreciate you sharing with your friends and family so they too can learn how to live life on purpose, not by accident. So you do not miss the next episode. Please subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and please also post a review. I look forward to reading your comments. This has been Dwight Heck. If you want to check out other podcast episodes or today's show notes, please check out my website, giveaheck.com. And until next time, Together, let us all strive to give a heck.